So physics, you're touching the fundamentals of reality. Uh, how, how do you do it? What, what makes it so fascinating for you? I, th I think I love this aspect of physics that you can ask, well, you can see the universe doing surprising things, and you can see the world around you doing really surprising things. And at first you think, that I, I must have misunderstood. And then you go back and you do a careful measurement, and you realize you're catching it in the act of doing something that you never would have believed that the universe could be doing. I think. Uh, you know, I mean, a, a great example may have just been the fact that the universe apparently is getting bigger all the time, and that you know, and that was something the Hubble discovered back in the 30s. But another example is what what we saw when we uh, started to me measure the slowing we thought of the of that expansion, and we discovered that it wasn't. It's actually speeding up. Um, why should the universe be acting that particular way? This, you know, these things are great to catch in the act. That was truly a remarkable breakthrough that changed our whole understanding of what the universe is, reflects on all the, the, the fundamental theories of physics. I mean, a terrific thing, but, you know, people admire it greatly, but, you know, this was not something you did in an afternoon. This was a, a decade-long project. And what, what, what are some of the, the nitty-gritty practical details that you had to wrestle with and solve and... And, 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 and enjoy the, the practical fascination. Right. I, I think to really enjoy physics uh, of the kind that we're doing, where you're actually going out and making measurements, you just have to love solving problems, you know, one after another after another, and, and enjoying the fact that you're trying to get to something that you think is a, a really worthwhile goal, um, but liking all of the inventions that you have to come up with along the way, all the you know, creativity of uh, you know, different people in your group all have to... Uh, figure out how to you know, get this thing working and this thing working and this thing working. Often there are things that nobody thought you could actually do. And uh, there's a, I think there's sort of a, almost a requirement to do this kind of experimental physics of keeping a certain amount of pure optimism uh, that you'll be able to get the solution to these things. It's, um, I think it's built up as traditions in, in, in different groups, uh, in, in different research groups, this idea of a uh, of sort of a can-do attitude that okay, it's tough, but we're good, we'll figure it out. And, uh, and it sometimes looks like arrogance, but in some sense it's almost a, 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 an intentional fooling of yourself to believe that you're going to be able to get to solve the problem so that you'll stick to it long enough to actually solve the problem. Well, in your work where you discovered the accelerating expansion, you used the fact that the supernova, which all have the same intrinsic brightness, have, have, have a different, were dimmer than they should have been as you go back in the universe. But they could have been dimmer for a whole lot of different reasons. There could have been a lot of dust in there. How, how do you eliminate all these complexities? And the universe is, is moving, and the Earth is moving, and all sorts of movements. Yeah, no, I mean, precisely. In fact, when we began, you know, began the project, I mean, there was, there was countless things that, we, that would make it impossible to do. I mean, you were trying to find uh, supernovae that are far away enough that you could actually make the measurement. Nobody had ever seen a supernova that far away, uh, you know, and, and certainly not tens of them. And you you need a lot of them, not just one or two. Exactly, and you have to catch them early because, uh, you know, if, if you caught them after they'd already peaked, then you didn't know how bright they were at peak, and that's the thing that you... When they exploded, they, 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 grad, they, they peak within they, a... They brighten, then they fade away. You within know, a weeks. Exactly, exactly. Right. And so you don't have much time. Uh, we have to, you know, in fact, you have to apply for these the biggest telescopes in the world that you need to make this kind of measurement, you have to apply to use them months and months in advance, and you get maybe one night, two nights on a telescope. Uh, you know, it, it's, it was uh, one of these you know, impossible concepts that you would write a proposal saying that we will observe you know, night of March the 3rd um, because maybe or maybe not a supernova might explode in the next 500 years. I mean, it just, <laughs> you know, it just didn't work. Um, and so a lot of the early parts of the, of the work had to be figuring out how to turn something that was a very difficult measurement into something that was a practical measurement. And so we came up with ways of designing whole new instruments that had uh, you know, many, many more pixels of a camera on the sky than everybody any, any, any had ever done before uh, to observe many more galaxies at one time. Uh, we had to figure out, in the long run, how to compare the supernova that we would see at very great distances, where they would look much redder, to the ones that we'd see nearby that would look much bluer. The comparison wasn't obvious, you know, what we'd be comparing when you compared one to the other, since you'd be seeing different parts of the wavelengths uh, uh, of the spectrum. So there are a whole lot of, 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 uh, of very practical problems that you'd have to solve. And, and going in, it would seem like that's almost impossible, but the... 
But, but, but I, I, and, and, you, and you end up breaking them down. You say, well, look, let's take them one at a time. You know, the first thing we need to do is show that we have those supernovae there. And, uh, and in fact, a, a, another project had even found one that was too late, but at least we knew it existed um, in, in that distance range. Then we had to figure out a way of finding lots of them, and we, and we developed those techniques. I can tell you about it. It's kind of fun. Um, but, uh, and that involved, in the end, uh, you know, teams of, oh, probably we were, you know, we were running a dozen people um, in order to find a batch of supernova, and we'd be sending them to different parts of the world. Uh, you know, one team would be off to Chile, another yeah. team would be off to Hawaii, another yeah. team would be down to Tucson, yeah. and we'd have a group back in Berkeley. We'd be using the cutting edge of what was then a fledgling internet. Nobody uh, was able to, you know, to coordinate the whole thing and bring the data back to the newest, biggest computers that we had, which was at the computer center at Berkeley. Uh, you, know, you just have to pull together all these practicalities. In some sense, it was sort of more of an orchestration problem. How are you going to keep all these very smart people um, all working uh, in a coordinated, focused way to be able to accomplish these results. And, and one of the interesting things, especially for breakthrough uh, observations and ideas, is that there was a, comp a competing team that That's was right. uh, trying to beat you to the punch and you were trying to beat them to the, to the ultimate thing and you were very strong competitors. And yet, I find it wonderful that, that if e either team violently comp competing if you had cloudy days or problems, you'd cover for each other. That's right. I mean, even in, 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 the, in the height of our, of our fiercest competition, um, there were still times when uh, one of us needed some data and we had bad weather. And, you know, we're astronomers you know, at these telescopes, and we all know what it's like when you absolutely need a, a key piece of data and you can't get it. And if we could do it, we, it did happen that uh, one team or the other managed to get some data for the other team uh, on, on some key moment when, when, it was, when it was necessary. And, and I think that at least shows that the un underneath all the competition, you know, even when people are, you know, uh, there's all the, 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 the difficulties and, and, the, and the rivalries between groups, underneath it is to try to serve some, some you know, goal, which is to try to get an answer that people can believe. And there's something that's so different about a, a result where two different teams have gotten the same result uh, than a, a result where one team sees it and nobody else has re can reproduce it. Right, and, and, and what you're dealing with is not only a, what, what it, at the time was completely counterintuitive, which people expected exactly the opposite, but you're dealing with some of the most fundamental, perhaps the, the most fundamental question human beings can ask. And, and so if you see an answer that's surprising, the correct position for most, for any scientist to take is, well, there's probably something wrong with the measurement. And that's where you have to begin, and in fact, that's where we begin. So as a, I think people often think that as a scientist, what you're doing is you're spending most of your time trying to prove your, your theory or your, or your results is right. In fact, my experience has been that 95% of your time, maybe more, is spent trying to figure out how you made a mistake and looking to see, could there be something wrong with what I'm doing? And trying to ask all the possible ways in which you could have something incorrect in, in, in the chain of logic and looking for ways that you can check it and find it and, ca and, and, and catch the Because problem. if you don't do that, as soon as you publish, everybody else is going to do that. Right. You, you, um, the, the goal is that, you know, that everybody is, is being fierce in their uh, uh, critical facilities of trying to figure out what could be wrong with any different thing that's in these very delicate chains of argument. And if, you, uh, if you're going to make any sense out of it, you have to be playing that role yourself. You have to be asking yourself, how am I fooling myself in looking at this data? And that's most of what you, I believe, get trained uh, for as a good experimental scientist, um, to know how to be constantly asking yourself, what's wrong with what I'm assuming? In this and that's space. part of the fascination. And that's the fun, absolutely. I mean, I think to be able to well, I, I just mentioned that you need to have a certain kind of arrogance to think that you can solve these problems, but then you have to have a, a true, deeply ingrained humility to really take seriously the fact that you could be wrong in every one of the assumptions you made, in every calculation you, you ever calculated, that every one of them needs to be checked and cross-checked, and you have to come up with a way of telling if you are fooling yourself. Um, and in the end, I've, I've been saying to people, I think I, you, you have to bring that same arrogance that you bring to the problem of how do you tackle uh, you know, difficult measurements in the world, you have to bring that arrogance to the to the fact that you are going to be able to catch yourself making mistakes. And you're going to look for those mistakes you know, in, in that same spirit of uh, can do, we're going to find what's wrong with, with these measurements. And, and that's really where all your time goes in, into trying to figure out you know, how you can tell if what you're doing is, is, uh, is mistaken.